Hi guys, welcome to The Guitar Show. In this video, we're gonna be looking at the amplifiers of Eric Clapton. My name is Ramon Goose, and I just wanna say a big thanks to all the guys that have suggested guitar history videos for this channel. I've been doing it a few years now, so it's always interesting to get some new ideas. Okay guys, without further ado, let's get straight into this, and I'll see you at the end of the video. In January 1963, Clapton met up with Tom McGuinness at the Prince of Wales pub in New Malden. McGuinness was seeking a guitarist for his band, The Roosters, and Eric had been recommended by McGuinness's girlfriend, with whom he had attended art college. The lineup was Terry Brennan on vocals, Eric Clapton on guitar, Robin Mason on drums, Tom McGuinness on guitar, and also Ben Palmer on piano. Clapton said the Roosters rehearsed more than we played. Even though we did a gig every now and then, mostly in upstairs rooms in pubs, it was more the excitement of meeting like-minded blues people. McGuinness from the Roosters states, Eric was labouring, having been thrown out of art school. When the Roosters began rehearsing at a pub, I remember Eric turning up after spending the day plastering or helping out his grandfather lay floors. We didn't have much equipment and we never found a bass player, but we never worried about it because we were very young and enthusiastic. We only had one amplifier, it was the Selma True Voice, and through it we put two guitars and Terry's vocals. I don't remember us being very loud, but Ben Palmer had to hammer his piano to be heard as we didn't have a microphone. It was in the Roosters that Clapton first heard the song Hideaway by Freddie King. It was a great influence on Clapton and would transform his playing. And as you can see from the photo, this is a Samuel True Voice blood and custard livery amp from around 1959 to 61. And according to the Selma documentation, it featured controls for volume, treble and bass on and off. It also had one high gain low noise pentode, one high sensitivity output pentode and one full wave rectifier into a 10 inch elliptical speaker. Eric's first taste of international recognition came when he was asked by Keith Reef to replace Anthony Top Topham as a lead guitarist for the Yardbirds in October 1963. The next amplifier is a 1960s Vox AC30. Now Eric was seen using this amp with the Yardbirds during the band's Ready Steady Go performance on May the 22nd of 1964. Eric Clapton left the Yardbirds to join John Mayall's Blues Breakers and in turn the Yardbirds recruited Jeff Beck and reportedly Eric's Vox AC30 amp was passed on to Jeff as part of the band's deal with him. According to journalist Henry Yates, Clapton found the Vox combo too toppy. The 1964 Vox would have featured 2x12 Celestian Silver Al Nico speakers. It would have featured four EL84 power tubes. Whilst feeling disenchanted with the direction the Yardbirds were taking, Eric received a call to join John Mayall's Blues Breakers. And Clapton joined the Blues Breakers in April 1965 and then went on to live with John Mayall and his family in Lee Green, London. Eric joined the Blues Breakers in April 1965 and you can see here he still has his Telecaster that he used in the Yardbirds but this time he's playing it through a Plexi JTM45 and what's interesting about this Marshall head is that it's a white colour. As you can see it still has the larger Plexi Marshall logo which would mean it's probably a 1965 model. As you can see in this photo here, Marshall did actually offer some variations on just the black toilet covering. And you can see here this has got a really cool two-tone white and black covering. But also in 1965, Marshall made six white cream coloured JTM45s, which were custom made for Brian Poole and the Tremolos. Now Eric had played with Brian Poole and the Tremolos whilst in the Yardbirds in 1964. And who knows, maybe Eric was able to get one of Brian Poole's white JTM45s just before he joined the Blues Breakers in April 65. You can also see him playing his famous Les Paul Sunburst with this white JTM45. And you can see in the photo he hasn't taken off the pickup covers yet. Eric's early recordings that predated the Glands trip to Greece included Telephone Blues, I Am Your Witch Doctor and Bernard Jenkins with John Mayall which were in fact recorded not with a Bluesbreaker combo amp, 
but a JTM 45 head and a 4x12 Marshall cabinet. And in this photo here, before he sets off to Greece with the glands, he now has a black JTM 45 amplifier. And again, he still hasn't taken the pickup covers off his guitar. Apparently this photo was taken in late August. And obviously this would have been a brand new amplifier made in 1965 with the Plexi logo. This is the amplifier that Eric sets off very soon after this photo was taken to Greece and actually ends up leaving this amp behind in Greece. So this black Toilex covered Marshall JTM45 is the amplifier that he left in Greece in October 1965. And instead he turns up in November the 4th with John Mel's Blues Breakers playing a Marshall Blues Breaker combo amplifier. And this Series 2 Blues Breaker combo would be the amplifier that he goes on to record with. Eric went to the Marshall shop and bought a 1962 combo. This would have been cheaper and more convenient to transport in John Mel's van. The first amplifier that established the Marshall's tone on record was their first combo design called the Model 1962. And this was of course used by Eric on amazing effect on the John Mayall Blues Breakers album. And of course, Blues Breaker became the amplifier's nickname. This was initially produced in late 1964 and early 1965. And it appeared in Marshall's second ever catalogue printed in the middle of 1965. The first series of amps was actually a bit bigger, about three inches larger in every dimension than most other Marshall combos made ever since. These combos were available in a 4x10 or 2x12 configurations, as models 1961 and 1962 respectively. The 4x10 used a tremolo version of the 1987 lead amplifier, since it was intended as a guitar amp. The 1962, however, was advertised as a bass and lead amplifier and used a 1986 bass chassis, again with tremolo. The 1962 and 1961 amplifiers were listed at 115 and 110 pounds respectively. Interestingly, the Vox AC30 at the same period was a bit more money and that cost 143 pounds. To buy a Fender Basement in England would have cost 189 pounds. These cabinets were actually designed by Jim Marshall himself. At first they used white speaker grill cloth, followed later in the same year by the grey and white plasticky stripped cloth now refers to as blues breaker cloth. According to the catalogues they basically remain unchanged until late 1966 when a second series was introduced which had a revised style of cabinet designed this time by Ken Bran. We can clearly see in this photo that Eric is using a series 2 blues breaker combo. The second series was available in both combo and extension cabinet versions from around August 1965. And this explains how Eric was photographed with one early in 1966 during the John Mayall sessions. It's no doubt guitarists other than Eric had recorded with Marshall prior to 1966. But it wasn't until Eric's playing on John Mayall's Blues Breakers album where the Marshall Overdrive sound was born. And the marriage between Eric's Les Paul Sunburst and this Marshall Blues Breaker combo was the perfect tonal recipe. Eric has said of this amp that he didn't know what became of this amp but he did say that he bought it directly from Jim's shop in Hamwell, probably around the time of November 1965, just after he returned from his Greek jaunt with the glands to reform John Mayall. It would be reasonable to assume that the amplifier used KT66 tubes and a GZ34 rectifier tube. Although the Celestian speakers used at the time were going through a transitional period, from the original G12 with the Alnico magnets to the later versions that used ceramic magnets, it's probably hard to say which one of these would be fitted to the actual Clapton amp, as both versions would have been available at this time. It would be wise to presume that Eric Clapton's amp had the Alnico G12s in it. During the Cream era, Eric used a JTM 45 100 watts. In 1965, Britain was reveling in the hysteria of the beat boom. America was succumbing to the British invasion, and Pete Townsend needed a bigger amp. So Jim Marshall and Ken Bran went to work on the prototype 100 watt head. Jim says, I had known Pete Townsend for many years because I used to play with his father, who was a very good alto clarinet player. We were so proud of those first 100 watt amps. And at the same time, Pete said, I want something bigger, an 8x12. I said that I thought his roadies would have trouble handling it. And sure enough, the roadies complained. So after a couple of weeks, Pete came back and said, 
You were right, but can you still give me the height but in two cabinets? He wanted it cut in half, but that was impossible. So we built two separate cabinets stacked on top of each other. Really, the stack was a combination of the design ideas of Pete Townsend and myself. Initially, we built the stacks for looks and as a backdrop rather than anything else. Jim Marshall fitted four KT66 valves and two JTM45 output transformers, giving a total power output in excess of 100 watts. It was during this period of development that the company decided that the use of the GZ34 rectifier valves just wasn't worth the trouble and that an electronic semiconductor would do the job just as well. Eric's JTM45 100 model most likely contained KT66 output valves and of course EL34s were later used. These early JTM45 100 models included the Drake 1204-43 power transformer. Here we can see Eric using a super tremolo head acquired around June 1966 with a 1968 cab which featured two G12 20 watt T1221S speakers. And this was a half stack that he used with fresh cream. Here we see Eric with a super amplifier head, which is the JTM45 100, with 1982A and 1982B cabinets. These featured the G12H 25 watt speakers. The second stack pictured here with Eric was added around January 1967. When interviewed in 1968 by the Rolling Stone magazine, Eric says, I use two 100 watt marshals. I set them full on everything, full treble, full bass and full presence. Same with the controls on the guitar. If you've got the amp and guitar full, there is so much volume that you can get it 100 miles away and it's going to feed back, the sustaining effect, and anywhere in the vicinity, it's going to feed back. Eric received the updated version of these 100 watt amps with the EL34 valve at some point after 1967. If you check out this photo, guys, of his performance at Blind Faith's Hyde Park concert in London on June the 7th, 1969, you can clearly see here that it has a Marshall Reading Super Lead 100, meaning that the amp was used on a cream tour. This leads us to conclude that the switch over to the Super 100 amplifier happened during Cream's existence. A second stack with a JTM45 Super 100 head was added in January 1967 and soon after in 1967 a JTM 100 with EL34 valves was used in the recording of Disraeli Gears. This was last seen on November 1967. After this a JMP 100 Super Tremolo plus a Super Lead head was used in late 1967 early 68. Cream relied on their instrument stacks the drummer's muscle power and a PA for vocals. The instruments were not amplified through the PA. This is clear from any constant photo. The PA system's four vocals varied from folded horns used at Fillmore to the more common stacks of column PA cabinets. Eric set his amplifier full on everything, full treble, full bass and full presence. Clapton then controlled the sound via his volume and tone controls on his guitar. Eric would use the low sensitivity second input on the amplifier. Eric would use single stacks well into 1967. In fact, they used a different combination of cabinets. And this was down to the fact that they probably blew speakers. These 4x12 cabinets were only rated at 75 watts. Most likely in 1967, these speakers were upgraded to a more reliable 100 watt cabinet. After performing at the Murray The K Show in March 1967, Cream entered Atlantic Studios and in this photo we can see two 1959s each on a single cab. One flat, extra tall and one angle and these appear to be in mint condition. These were not their road amplifiers and had been bought via the distributor who was based in Long Island. On Cream's return to the UK, Jack Bruce and Eric Clapton now had an extra stack each. So two 1959 heads. Cream were most likely influenced by The Who, who had also switched to dual cabinets and heads. Cream needed to get louder to maintain volume levels in larger venues that they were now playing. They had gone from venues holding a few hundred at best, to ones that held thousands. Clapton would sometimes stand away from his stacks and closer to the drums, just to be able to hear the rest of the band 
and to stay out of the line of fire of his amplifier. Ginger Baker was quoted as saying, Instead of having just one bass speaker and one guitar speaker either side of me, it suddenly grew into these huge double stacks. It got severely painful, and my pleas to turn it down were greeted with, No man, you're crazy. You can see in this photo that Eric is using a Y splitter cable plugged into input number two. It's worth pointing out this photo here, which was taken in March 1969, which was part of the music documentary film called The Super Show. It's great to see Eric plugging his Firebird through his two marshals and jamming with Buddy Guy. In early 1969, Eric started jamming with Stevie Winwood of Traffic. The jamming happened at Eric's house. It was rumoured in the British press that Eric and Stevie would record an album with the Stax rhythm section, who were Donald Duck Dunn and Al Jackson. However, when Ginger Baker learned that Eric was jamming with Stevie Winwood, he also wanted to participate. In April 1969, the family's Rick Greck joined them as well. So guys, check out these photos from the rehearsal at Eric's house. And here you can see bass player Rick plugging into one of Eric's 100 watt Marshall amplifiers. And Eric is playing his 335 through what looks like to be a blonde Fender Tremolux amplifier. The Fender Tremolux amp was built for 11 years, from 1955 until 1966. The amp featured a 2 by 10 inch speaker cabinet, and its power output was 35 watts. Engineer Andy Jones recorded most of the Blind Faith backing tracks at Morgan Studios, and the album was finally finished at Olympic Studios, with Alan O'Duffy engineering and Jimmy Miller producing. So the big question guys is, did Eric use his Fender Tremolux to record the Blind Faith material or did he use his marshals? Despite having these great studio shots of Clapton with his Telecaster, unfortunately we cannot see his guitar amp. On a sunny Saturday on the 7th of June 1969, Blind Faith performed at Free Festival in London's Hyde Park. And here we can see Eric's two Marshall stacks, which was basically the same setup as he had when he was in Cream. And as you've seen before, these amps have the Cream logo on the back of them. And you can see that this is one of the newer Marshall JTM4500 amps, as it reads Super Lead 100. From June 1969, Blind Faith embarked on a Scandinavian tour. They performed in Helensky, Oslo, Stockholm and Gothenburg, amongst other places. For this tour, Clapton stayed pretty close to his amps, playing a Sunburst Telecaster. He also had a 50s Les Paul Sunburst guitar. Okay guys, so this is amazing. In June 1969, Blind Faith performed in Gothenburg. And as you can see from this photo, Eric is playing a burst. Check out the link I've put in the description and you can hear a bootleg actually from that gig. Some of the tones take you right back to the Blues Breakers. And it's really nice to hear Clapton playing the Les Paul through his Marshall stacks. From July 1969, Blind Faith undertook a North American tour. This marked the end of Eric's Marshall era. And as we can see from these Blind Faith concert photos, he switched to a Silverface Dual Showman Reverb Amplifier, otherwise known as a TFL 5000D. These amplifiers featured a huge 2x15 cabinet, which contained the two 15-inch JBL speakers. These amplifiers have always been known as being very loud. These amps featured four 6L6 GC power valves and a solid-state rectifier. After the Blind Faith tour finished, Clapton stepped out of the spotlight, first to sit in with the Plastic Ono band, and then he joined up with Delaney and Bonnie, who actually opened for Blind Faith on their North American tour. For these concerts, Eric continued to use his Fender Dual Showman. To quote Eric, I use a Dual Showman, a big Fender amp, but I hardly ever check it right up, you know. I'm not getting the sustain or the hold over sound I used to get. It's still there a bit, but that's the Stratocaster. When I use the Stratocaster with the Dual Showman, I have the pickup switch set between the first and the middle pickups, which is a very bright sound, but not completely trebly. I take a little bit of the treble off, and I put on all of the bass and the middle, and I set the volume about half. Eric recorded his first solo album between November 69 and March 1970. After this, he started a new project with Bobby Whitlock, Carl Raddle, Jim Gordon, Dave Mason. They called themselves Derek and the Dominoes. They gave their first live performance on 14th of June 1970 at the Lyceum Theatre in London. 
And as you can see from this photo, Eric is still using the Fender Showman stacks. The Domino's album, Layla and Other Assorted Love Songs, was recorded in Miami, Florida on 23rd of August 1970. Its album's producer was Tom Dowd. The first few days of the Layla sessions were unproductive. However, Tom Dowd took the Dominoes to an Allman Brothers concert. Eric Clapton first heard Dwayne Allman play in person. Afterwards, Eric invited Dwayne to the Layla album sessions. The album sessions weren't recorded at loud volume and Eric had walked in carrying just a pair of small combos. Tom Dowd remembers that Eric turned up with a champ under one arm and a Fender Princeton under another. And that was it. He and Dwayne used those amps switching back and forth. Brothers Ron and Howard Albert, the recording engineers who worked on the Layla sessions with Tom Dowd said, If you looked through the control room glass, the piano was to the left and on top of the piano, which had the lid closed, were our champ amps that Eric and Dwayne both used. Now guys, a lot of people seem to think it was just Fender Tweed champs that were used on the Layla sessions. I just want to read you another quote from the Albert Brothers. It certainly wasn't the first record we ever used a champ on. And for those sessions, I think one was Eric's and the other one belonged to the studio. And I believe that one might have been a blackface champ. So from my research guys, I would say the album was recorded with one Fender Tweed champ and one Fender blackface champ. For three weeks from August the 1st, Derek and the Dominoes performed in clubs and other small venues in Britain. Eric chose to play anonymously, still weary from the fame that he felt had plagued Cream and Blind Faith. Admission for the shows was set at £1, and the contract with each venue stipulated that Clapton's name was not to be used as a crowd puller. For these first shows, Eric used his blonde Tremolux amp, and of course this was the same amplifier that was seen in the photos for the Blind Faith rehearsals. In this photo you can also see a Fender Dual Showman, which was probably used as a backup amp. As you can see there's two cabinets used with a Fender Tremolux. One of these appears to be a 2x12 and the other appears to be a 2x10. After the Tremolux, Clapton was using a Dual Showman reverb rig for the early part of the Derek and the Dominoes touring schedule. When Derek and the Dominoes played a concert in Birmingham on August the 9th 1970, a fan that was used to the really high volume levels of the Cream concerts heckled Clapton and complained that his guitar wasn't loud enough. So after the show, Clapton sent out his road manager to buy him a Marshall stack. Clapton used the Marshall for the rest of the tour. After recording their album, the four piece Derek and the Dominoes returned to the UK to continue touring before heading back to America to start the US tour on 15th of October. Okay guys, let's look at this advert from Sun Amplifiers from the 1970s. This is a photo taken of Eric at the Fillmore East concerts on 23rd of October 1970. And as you can see here in this photo, there are two Sun Coliseum heads on top of Marshall cabinets. And as you can see from this photo, there is one Coliseum amp on top of a Marshall cabinet, although Clapton has actually masked over the Marshall logo. The Sun Coliseum lead amplifier was 330 watts RMS and it was an all solid state design. In my opinion it seems that Eric was trying to get a very loud clean sound which was quite the opposite from his earlier tones. Eric seems to have liked the sound of the Marshall cabinets and preferred them to the Sun speaker cabinets and they were rewired to 4 ohms. In this photo here we can see Eric using Music Man amplifiers. This photo was taken in 1974. In 1974, a company called Trisonic changed its name to Music Man and named Leo Fender as the president in 1975. The company's first amplifier was the 65 Combo. Later, it released a head and cab called the HD-130. And this is the amplifier that Eric started to use from 1974. In this Music Man advert from 1976, you can see Eric on stage in front of three HD-130 stacks. The cover of the 1978 album, Backless, shows Clapton with Blackie warming up through a Music Man combo. The Music Man HD-130 reverb amp was made to compete with the Silverface Fender Twin Reverb. This is a Music Man 210 HD-130, which features the same amplifier chassis as the HD-130 reverb, except it's housed in a combo configuration with a pair of 10-inch Alnico speakers. Clapton used this amp at a Valentine's Day dance at Crenlay Village Hall, Surrey, on February the 14th, 1977. Clapton recorded numerous tracks with this Music Man combo long after he stopped using the Music Mans on stage. 
This studio shot is from 1977, right after Eric had finished recording the J.J. Kale song, Cocaine, from the Slow Hand album. Here we can see Eric and guitar player John Terry's rigs, just after they finished recording Cocaine. And as you can see, these are the Music Man HD-130 reverb amplifiers. The Music Man's output was 130 watts. The output stage comprised of four EL34s, but it used a solid state preamp circuit in each channel for a clean and reliable signal chain. Some of these amps used a 12AX7 in the phase inverter stage, but it was later changed to a solid state inverter circuit too. Due to the solid state preamp and valve power section, these amps were sometimes called hybrid amps. Here we can see Eric recording No Reason to Cry at Shangri-La Recording Studios on November the 21st, 1975 in Malibu, California. And we can see that Eric's using a Tweed Twin. So this goes to show that Eric was quite happy using smaller combo amplifiers instead of his larger road rigs. And we can still see that in 1983, Eric was still playing through a Music Man amplifier. To quote Eric, the first Music Man amps were really great, but then I started blowing them up a lot and they started sounding really thin. So I went back to Marshall in around 1985. Okay guys, this photo is from 1984 at Wembley Stadium, London. And we have Carlos Santana, Bob Dylan, Mick Taylor and Eric all playing together. Eric's back line here was two Marshall amplifiers. One was a Super Lead 100 and the other was a JCM 800. The Marshall heads are both sitting upon Music Man cabinets. So this marks the first time that Eric decided to use something else. Also at this concert was a Music Man combo. So it seems like Eric has supplied all the amplifiers for this gig himself. Mike Hill, formerly a director of Marshall Amplification, he was contacted by Eric's guitar technician and visited him at Shepperton, where he was rehearsing for Roger Waters tour and personally delivered a Marshall 1959 Super Lead and a 1987 Lead 50 amplifiers with 1960 speaker cabinets. Clapton's guitar tech stated that having tried the 50 watt amplifiers brought by Mike Hill, Clapton loved them and bought two of the 50 watt 1987 and 100 watt 1959 models. Clapton went on to use these amplifiers in 1984 on the Roger Waters Pros and Cons of Hitchhiking Tour, as well as Eric's own tours from 1985 to 1987, including the Live Aid concert at JFK Stadium on 13th of July, 1985. We can also see that the video for Forever Man off of 1985's Behind the Sun album feature a Marshall stack Eric also used a Marshall JCM800 head on stage during the early 2000s to drive a Leslie rotating speaker cabinet. Here we have a 1980s Dean Markley Signature Series 120. During the period from 1984 until 1988, Eric's amplifiers were usually placed off stage, accessible to his guitar tech, and only the Marshall speaker cabinets were visible on stage to the audience. However, sometimes when Eric was guesting with other acts, you could see the amps on stage. And here we can see Eric and Tina Turner performing Tearing Us Apart at the Princess Trust Rock Gala in Wembley Arena, 20th of July 1986. And to the right of Eric Clapton, we can see the Dean Markley amplifiers. From 1986's August album until 1989's Journeyman album, Eric spent most of this time on tour. Now I'm a big fan of the Eric's August album. And whilst researching this, I actually found out that he used two Rocket 30 combos. They had custom-made 12-inch Celestian G12C30 speakers. It actually has no tubes. This is a solid-state amplifier. But I, in fact, use an 80s session amp myself for teaching purposes. And I can say they got a great clean tone. And it's quite surprising, actually. Sometime around mid-1987, he changed the Dean Markley and Marshall amp setup in his Bob Bradshaw design stage rig to a pair of new Fender Dual Showman amps. For the time, these had a new 100 watt circuit, which featured four 6L6GC power amp valves and four 12AX7 preamp valves. It also had a 1287 valve for the effects loop. You can see Eric playing these amps at the Nelson Mandela 70th birthday tribute at Wembley Stadium on June the 11th, 1988. At this concert, Eric shared the stage with Dire Straits. In fact, it was at the rehearsal with Dire Straits for this concert that Eric really loved the tone that Mark Knopfler was getting from his Soldano amp. Eric would use these dual showman amps in the studio while he was recording Journeyman. 
for those of you wondering what the Duck Bros logo is about, Albert Lee says, When I joined Eric's band in 1979, I had this duck call, and of course Eric was enchanted with it. I think during rehearsals, one of the crew went to a hunting shop and came back with a couple of duck calls and some shoulder holsters. So Eric and I became the Fabulous Duck Brothers. The next thing we had t-shirts made up with Fabulous Duck Brothers on them, and then Sterling Ball from Ernie Ball made up some pics with the Fabulous Duck Brothers on them as well. And every once in a while we would pull out these duck calls and drive everybody mad with them. In 1988, Californian custom amp builder Michael Soldano was commissioned to build two of his SLO 100 amplifiers for Eric. Clapton said he heard Mark Knopfler at rehearsals and was impressed by his sound. He realised it was Knopfler's amp rather than the guitar that was responsible for the sound character. After Eric tried Knopfler's amp, he placed an order with Michael Soldano. Eric said that although he was allowed to go to the top of the waiting list, he still waited two months before he received the amplifiers because they were all handmade and not mass produced. In a guitar magazine interview in 1994, Eric's guitar tech says, The Soldanos are original amps that Mike built for us in a hurry. Of course we bought them, but Eric gave him a signed Clapton Strat, which we thought was a fair deal. Eric said, in return, why don't you sign my amps? So that's what he did. We have two, one as a spare, but I like to alternate them so the valves are properly burnt in on both. As you can see, Eric used these amplifiers with Marshall 4x12 cabinets. Here's a photo of Eric with a 1957 Fender Twin amplifier. Model number 5E8A. This amplifier was acquired in the 1980s and it was extensively modified by Caesar Diaz. And this became Eric's favourite amp. He used this at Bob Dylan's anniversary concert in 1992 and on From the Cradle Tours from 1994 and also the Hyde Park concert from 1996. I found it at Pete's Guitars in Minneapolis, St Paul's years ago. It's been rewired several times because it heats up. CZ Diaz came in and insulated everything with this extra strong cable because it would melt after you played it for a while. In a ToneQuest report, CZ Diaz commented, I took Clapton's low power Tweed Twin, the one with two rectifiers, and I changed the transformer to a Fender Export Transformer. I also took two rectifiers out and replaced them with silicon diode and installed two more 6L6s, just like you'd see in a later twin. For speakers, we used Jensen Gold Labels 12. Russ Titleman, the producer of From the Cradle, confirmed that about 90% of Clapton's broad palette of guitar tones on the album were achieved by an old Fender twin. Clapton used the same modified amp for the blues tour following the release of From the Cradle. Here we can see in this photo Clapton first used this amp on stage during the blues nights in his marathon 24 nights at the Royal Albert Hall in February 1991. This photo is Eric playing with George Harrison on their 1991 tour of Japan. They used two 59 Baseman reissue amps. Fender's 59 Baseman reissue made its debut in 1990. It cost a lot less than a vintage Baseman and was easier to maintain. The reissue circuit was based on the 5F6A circuit found on the Baseman combos that Fender made from 1958 through to 1960. The reissue is not an exact reproduction as it uses a printed circuit board instead of point to point wiring. The speakers are different and the cabinet is birch plywood instead of solid pine. When Fender established the Amplifier Custom Shop in Scottsdale, Arizona in 1993, under the direction of Bruce Zinke, the first amp that Zinke developed and Fender introduced later that year, the initial goal allegedly was to build an amp that Fender would be proud to offer Eric Clapton. In 1997, Clapton loaned Fender his Caesar DS modified 1957 Fender Twin Amp. This was so that Fender could try and figure out how to rebuild this amp. Fender Custom Shop Amp Tech John Sewer built four reproductions for Eric. He modded each circuit slightly differently, experimenting with different speakers to provide a better sound performance than the original one. Dale Breckenfield, Fender's Director of Artist Relations said, Eric considered his 1957 Twin the holy grail of amps, but since he only had one he was afraid of damaging it on tour. Our mission was to clone that amp, which was quite a difficult task. We first analysed the amp's specs, then we searched for old parts. After all that, it still didn't sound right. At that point, John Page of the Fender Custom Shop suggested we make the cabinet from old pine. We found some that came from an old church floor, and that made all the difference. Eric loved them and declared them to be exact replicas. 
In fact, he gave one to BB King as a gift. These amplifiers would become Eric's main stage amps from the moment he received them. They first appeared on stage with Eric during his European Jazz Festival tour in July 1997. He also used these amps on his 1998-1999 Pilgrim tour and also the Reptile tour from 2001 and the 2005 Cream reunion at the Royal Abbott Hall. The first amp that Zinke developed and Fender introduced later that year was the Vibra King. It was a 60 watt combo featuring a 3x10 speaker configuration, which was basically based on the 54 Fender Bandmaster combo. Eric owned a 1995 model and also a 2001 model. British amp tech Dennis Cornell modified these with a circuit that boosted the amp's mid-range frequencies. Clapton started using the Vibra Kings on tour in 2001. He found these amps better suited to the noiseless pickups he started using than his Fender Twins. Eric also used the Vibra King as his main stage amp on August 17th and 18th 2001 during his concerts at the Staples Center in Los Angeles. Eric seemed to be very pleased with the mods that Dennis Cornell had done on his Vibra King amplifiers. After this, Eric commissioned Cornell to build a custom amp for him. He wanted something similar to his favorite tweed Fender amp, but with a completely different circuit. Dennis Cornell made an 80 watt circuit similar to a Fender Twins with four 6L6 GT power valves and two 12AX7 preamp valves along with one 1287. It also had a switch on the back for reducing output power to 20 watts. It came with a simple two band EQ section. As Dennis Cornell describes this amp, with very few components in the signal path to corrupt the tone, its simplicity is its strength. Dennis made two amplifiers for Eric with the serial numbers DC1 and DC2. Both were Eric's main stage amps from 2002 until 2004. And that included his performance at the concert for George on November the 29th, 2002 at London's Royal Albert Hall. Originally the amp was designed to have two channels. However, Eric decided that he only wanted one channel and therefore the amp now is only available with one channel. Here we have a 2007 Fender 57 Twin Amp Crossroads model. These were issued as a limited edition of 50 amps to accompany the Eric Clapton signature Stratocaster Crossroads model. These were sold to benefit the Crossroads Center. These amps were used at the 2007 Crossroads Festival. In 2011, a collaboration between Eric and Fender yielded three amplifiers. The EC Twinalux, the EC Tremolux, and the EC Vibrochamp. These are all variations on their original 50s era ancestors. The 57 Twin, the 57 Deluxe, and the 57 Champ respectively. These were US handmade amps and they all featured 50s era output tube bias tremolo. They also came with a switchable power attenuator. To distinguish these amps from the normal reissues, Fender included a small EC badge on the bottom right of the speaker grill. In 2013, Eric bought a Dumble Overdrive Special amplifier from Groon Guitars in Nashville. Eric used the amplifier with the OD channel engaged. And we can see Eric using this amplifier on various gigs around 2013. Around this time he was also using his signature Fender Twinalux amplifiers. And in this photo we can see to the left a Twinalux and on the right is the Dumble Overdrive Special Combo amplifier. Apparently this was an EL34 HRM model. After making contact with Howard Dumble, Eric asked Dumble to rebuild his Twinilux amplifier. This amplifier used one blue Celestian and one greenback. Next, upon visiting Alexander Dumble, Eric spots a Fender Bandmaster that Dumble is currently working on. This amp actually belongs to Bob Rock. The story as told by Bob Rock himself says that this amp belonged to himself and Eric really loved it. So he asked Dumble if he could have that amp. Then Dumble called Bob Rock and asked if Bob wouldn't mind giving his amp to Eric. In the end, Dumble made two separate Bandmaster amps for Eric. These Bandmasters were not originals. These were Fender Tweed reissue Bandmaster amps, which Dumble completely gutted and put in all new circuitry. These two Bandmaster amps were fitted with G10 Greenback Celestian speakers. Whilst making this video, I contacted somebody who was close to Eric Clapton and his crew. Reportedly, Eric spent $100,000 on getting these two Dumble modded Bandmasters made. The original plan was that Dumble would make the Bandmaster 100 watts. The 57 Bandmaster reissue comes with 3x10 inch speakers. 
So to conclude, Eric was using these Fender Bandmaster reissues and apparently an original one until about 2018 when Dumble actually finished the modification on the two Bandmaster amplifiers. Guys, thanks so much for watching this video. It means a lot to me. Um, if you want to get some more content from this channel, you can always subscribe. It's up to you. I'm not pushing you to do it. But you can subscribe to the uh, Patreon site. Um, and you've got a few different tiers there. And if you want to just watch the coffee chats, you can do so. Or if you want to check out the full blues course, that's going to be uploaded very soon. So you can even request some lessons and we can hang out and chat and all that stuff. So till the next video, guys, God bless. Take care. Goose signing out.